We're with Dorothy Kelly from the University of Granada. Hi, Dorothy. Hi, Anthony. What's, what's your job these days, Dorothy? Oof, my job these days, basically, and most of my time is spent in post of vice rector mm. for internationalization at the university. Okay, so you're flying around the world. I'm afraid doing... so, yes, I'm flying around <laughs> the world, probably more than I should, but, but yes, okay. yeah, it's, um, I mean, it is a fascinating job. Yeah. But you're also a professor of, what's your title, professor of translation of studies? Translation. Of, of translation. translation. Of, of translation. translation at the university there. Yeah. So do you still teach at all or are you in touch? I do. Yes? I do. This is one of the problems of university management, in fact, is that it's not really fully professionalized. Mm -hmm. So, very much like university teaching is also a very, very multifaceted mm. post-university management too. So yeah, I have 50% teaching. Oh, really? Yeah. Dear me. Yeah. And you're in charge of a research group? Are you still doing that? No, I'm, I'm no longer in charge of the research group. Mm -hmm. I still belong to the research okay. group, but my colleague Cathy Way took over as right. coordinator okay. of the group some years ago. So that's an interesting research group on... on Mostly on you? translator training, yeah. although there, there are two or three major streams. Translator training, directionality, and legal <coughs> translation. Sorry, and? Legal translation. Legal, okay. And interpreting, so, which of course is right. Cathy's main thing. Okay, okay. But we know you mostly as an expert in translator training. Because you're also project. editor or co editor, is it? Of co editor, currently. <coughs> of, of the, the interpreter and translator trainer with mm. Maria Gonzalez Davis. Oh, right, okay. From Ramonjou. Good. In Barcelona, good. who has also written extensively on translation. Oh, yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay, so you managed to keep those three or four things going. More or less. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> More or less. It's not always right. easy. Right. I'd like to go back to your mid twenties. Okay. Okay. Uh, what were you doing then? Let's say 23, 24, 25. What was I doing in my mid twenties? I was a very young, very junior lecturer at the very recently founded School for Translators and Interpreters at the University of Granada. Oh, at the same place where you are now. Exactly. How did yes. you get there? Because you're not Spanish, are you? No, I'm certainly not Spanish. No. Life story. Um, let's start at undergraduate level. Oh, I okay. studied translating and interpreting, which Wh where then? in Harriet Watt. Okay. Harriet Watt Sc University in Scotland, Edinburgh. And Edinburgh so is. at the time when Ian Mason was, mm -hmm. was there and was head of department, and but then, wait, 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 wait! You're not Scottish either. No, I'm not. <laughs> I said I would start at undergraduate level, right. but okay, let's go. No, 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 just <laughs> no, it's fine. I was born in Northern Ireland. Right, so the accent, if the you accent. can hear a bit of the accent, is Northern Irish. If you're a good phonetician, yeah. you can hear the Northern Irish, you can hear Scottish, and you can probably also hear a lot of neutral international right. English, right. because I have lived abroad for 38 of the past 39 years. Yeah. So it's, um, Okay. Yeah. So, so, Ireland, Harriet Watt, Scotland, yeah, yeah. Harriet Watt, translating and interpreting in French and Spanish at a time when in the UK there were really very, very, very few undergraduate mm. programs in translating and interpreting. And in fact, Harriet Watt was the first one to use the, the name translating and interpreting in, in, really? in okay. the degree program. Okay. Yeah. And during that time, I also had two stays abroad. One in Geneva, mm -hmm. at the very well consolidated ETI at mm -hmm. the time, now Faculty of Translating mm -hmm. and Interpreting, um, and a semester in Spain, in northern Spain. Um, so the, not in Granada? Not in Granada, no, I was in Oviedo. Oh really? I was in okay. Oviedo where there was a wonderful, wonderful professor of English. Patricia Shaw, mm -hmm. yeah. who really was very, very forward-looking in, in the way that she approached the, the, the teaching of English and, and languages in general in Oviedo. In area. So I was lucky enough to be in Oviedo for a semester then, although it was a very special and very complicated time in Spain. What year is we're talking? We're talking 79, I'm telling you. Secrets. I was, I was in 79, yeah. We're sure. talking 79, so we're talking transition to democracy, a fascinating society, a very optimistic society, but on a personal level, a society which didn't have a great deal of time 
for foreign exchange students. Ah, okay. So it was actually quite hard to get involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I finished my degree, I, I went back to Geneva. Oh, really? And I worked as an English language assistant for a year in Geneva. Ah, okay. College Calvin. So what happened? How did you get to Granada then? How did I get to Granada? Well, over that year I decided I wanted to move on and I didn't mm. really want to stay in, in Geneva. And the school in Granada at that time was one of the only two schools in Spain. There was Barcelona mm -hmm. and there was Granada. And they needed staff, they were consolidating, they were adding language pairs to the program and, and so on. And so a colleague of mine who was already in Granada, also um, still at the department in Granada, working in interpreting, and mm. Martin, mm. Oh. said to me, they're looking for new staff, why don't you apply? So I did. And I thought, okay, I'll try this for a year. And that was um, 1981. So, okay, um, so you've been there. So yes, I tried it for a year. You've grown with I, the well, faculty, became a faculty then. And, and, uh, yeah, uh, and, and I think uh, that is actually where my interest in curricular design comes from. Uh, because when, when I got there, th there were constant debates about the structure of the program, the content of the program. It, it's to me, it's fascinating yeah. to see. We all had the, the a big struggle that, though in 1991, 92, right. trying to get it recognised, and that that's was right. where we really had to justify yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the the program in Spain started as a three-year diploma program. Um, I mean, I think it was set up by a very forward-looking team of people who saw there was a need for translators and interpreters who were well trained mm -hmm. in the country, and there certainly was at the time. Um, but what was very, very paradoxical about the whole thing was that when Spain then joined the then EEC in 1986, mm -hmm. in order to become a translator at the European Commission, which was one of the main aims of the school, you had to have a full undergraduate degree, so yeah. a five-year degree. Yeah. So we had all these people with pretty good training and well prepared to go and work at the EEC and in similar posts but they didn't actually have the qualifications to do so. Mm. So most of the first translators at the EEC are actually language graduates or law graduates, mm -hmm. some of them. Yeah. And then gradually as we moved on, and that took us to the, to the point you've just mentioned in the early 90s when there was quite some push and quite some lobbying. For but we were the fighting degree against degree the modern degree. language departments to, to get a work. It was a very tense situation. Yeah. Um, the modern languages departments were not terribly happy about translation becoming a full mm -hmm. degree program. So I, here's a dirty question. Were you trained in curricular development or no. pedagogy? So how did, no. how did we learn all this stuff? How did we learn all this stuff? Trial and error, I think, Anthony. Trial and error, which is probably not the best way to learn, yeah. but but I think I mean I do think we learned. Well, I, don't, I, I learned from reading about English language pedagogy and the, yeah. and the methods there. I mean, we yeah. drag it across in one discipline to another. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think what happens is you well in my, in my case certainly you find yourself in a situation where you're involved in curricular design because mm. it has to be done, and, and there's all this debate going on around you, and you know that most of the debate mm, doesn't really have, shouldn't really have a significant impact on, on what you're trying to do. Mm. Um, so you get involved and as I said trial and error and you see what you're doing and gradually I became very interested in it so of course yes you start mm. to read and you start mm. to read about higher education in general and I think in, to my mind a lot of this has to do with my move into or my involvement in management as well. Mm -hmm. An interest in higher education in general, the role of higher education in society, which I think is linked to curricular design. Yeah. I think your yeah, curricular yeah. design has to be informed by what you think a university is for. Um, you, you, you were one of the key players in the European Masters of Translation, mm -hmm. setting up that framework for high quality training in Europe. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a one-size-fits-all thing? Do you think that every program should meet certain basic criteria, or how, how should that work? 
No, and that's exactly how that whole committee started, that whole expert group. I think the, the commission called us. Um, it was very, very interesting. In 2006, I think it was, the commission convened a conference to talk about a project which they had for what they called a European Masters in, in Translation. And they presented translating and interpreting academics, most translating academics, from around Europe with a model curriculum. And they said, here, this is what we think you should be doing. Because they'd had great difficulty um, finding sufficient translators after the enlargement mm. of the European Union. So they had a look around the university and said, well, you know, of course, this is, the universities are not doing their job. Um, everyone has their own idea of what a university's job is. And employers have one view of what a university's job is, which I don't always agree with. But in this particular case, basically, they said, universities are not educating sufficient highly trained translators. Um, so this is what you should do, and this was a very, very traditional model curriculum. You, you have to do terminology, you have to do international relations, you mm -hmm. have to do... So you can imagine the outcry in a room full of, of academics. And, and, uh, so we got into some very, very interesting debate with them, and said, look, basically two things. No one model curriculum is ever going to work across Europe. It probably wouldn't even work within one country in many, many cases mm -hmm. because one size never fits all. And you need to look at two things. You need to look at where the students are coming from, so what are they bringing to, uh, to their curriculum, and what do you want to achieve? And in each context, what the students are bringing in and what you want to achieve is going to give you a different mm -hmm. design. Uh, so we suggested that they also situate this within the Bologna process, which mm -hmm. at the time was in very much in full swing and very much on the agenda. My feeling is it's sort of fallen off the agenda mm -hmm. now in, in many, many parts of, of Europe. Um, and we said, you know, the Bologna process is student-centred, outcome-centred, and certainly not content-centred. So they said, okay, this is interesting. And they put together a group of um, experts, people who are working in curricular design in different countries around, around Europe. Some of us knew each other quite well. Some of us did not know each other so well. But we had a fascinating three years. A fascinating three years working amongst ourselves with very different national and even disciplinary approaches, mm -hmm. theoretical approaches to translation as well, and working very, very closely with the Director General for Translation. Mm -hmm. So talking to the management level, but also talking to the translators themselves. And it really was very, very interesting. We had fantastic and very, very positive exchange. And we produced a document which I'm sure, like all documents, is, um, could be improved. But I think it managed to bring together the consensus amongst mm. the, the academics and between the academics and the professionals. Mm. And to me, it was a fascinating experience because it really did actually materialize a lot of what you have often called theoretical. You know, our competence models yeah, but, yeah. are theoretical yeah but they're based on observation and, and yes, in this case they're based on sort of close observation <coughs> yes. and consensus between the profession or one part of the profession yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, but I think a, a major employer nevertheless. but a fairly major yeah, employer yeah, yeah. of translators and, well, the and biggest translation agency, agency in the world it is indeed the biggest translator. so let's see you've got that emt competence wheel which is a well-known model now yeah. Yeah. you also have your own model of translation competence yeah. Um, yeah. increasingly cited is Pacte's model of translation competence. We've got three models out there. There are three, yeah. at least. Are they all good, or is yours much better, or how should people think, make sense of this? I think mine is, is prior to EMT, mm -hmm. 
So I would like to think there is some of mine in Good. Yes. EMT. Yeah. Because as I said, EMT was very much a, yeah. a consensual process. Um, mine is, I think, slightly different to Pactis, although it has elements in common, in that mine was never really, really intended to be a full description of professional practice as such. Mm. It was always designed to help us in our curricular design. So it was always designed to help those of us in the field, but also those who were not in the field, to understand what we were doing. Okay, good. So it's very yeah, much, yeah, yeah. It, mine is very, very definitely, it has no pretense whatsoever to be um, a full and exhaustive and comprehensive model of, of competence as such, mm. but rather it's an attempt to systematize what needs to be present in, in curricular design. Mm. I hasten to add, not in the form of compartmentalized modules, mm. but rather from an outcomes-based yes. perspective. Yes. Okay, so this is what okay. a translator, because the outcome of any mm. university program is the person. Mm. Mm. Um, this is what a person ready to work in the professional world of translation will know will be able to do. Okay. So that's what On that level, or, or associated levels, what kind of research do you think we could benefit from now? In the field of translation training? I think, yeah, for example, yeah. if you have other suggestions, uh, that's of interest. Yeah, maybe a couple of others as well, but one area that concerns me a great deal in translation training is the whole area of assessment. Um, and I think there's a great deal of work needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Design. Assessment of translations or of performance mm, process? Assessment yes. of performance, of process, assessment of learning. Mm, yes. Then my impression is that we still assess product. Mm. Um, and so we're describing translator competence and we describe it in terms of, of, of a complex set of abilities, knowledge, attitudes. But then what we assess is actually very often simply a text. So I think there's a great deal of work to be done on how to assess process, okay. how to assess and how to assess learning. Because at the end of a program, obviously, someone who is about to graduate should be able to produce. And that's where you test product. A professional product. Yes, right. But throughout the program, mm you need to be testing learning and you need to know what the student has learned in order to be able to take measures to help the student to learn what they have not yet learned. Okay. You really need yeah. to know what's happening. And I don't think we're very good at that in general, okay. in, in the discipline. And then one of my other um, areas of interest is directionality. Mm which I have not been able to work on for some time now, but I think there's still quite a lot of work to be done on the, the impact of translation and direction, not only on quality of the product, but also on the process. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a huge element there of confidence. Mm. It's very interesting. Mm. They came mm. up yesterday in some uh, of the debates uh, and so on. Um, so I would also like to see more research done okay. on directionality. It's a very good example of where people will simply quote received wisdom. Mm. You know, you should never translate out of your mother tongue. And people will say this and they will say it again and it's in codes of ethics. Mm. And then you think, okay, define mother tongue. Um, yeah. And why? Or look at markets like China. Where or look at parts of the world China, where yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there, there are simply not enough people outside China with the Chinese yeah. language skills to ensure that translation should be done into whatever a mother tongue is in each individual case. So, okay. Yeah. One final question. Go on. Your handbook for translator trainers yeah. is out of print. Yeah. How are we going to get a new version? It's out of print and out of date, Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> it was written for 2005, mm -hmm. 
I think much of it is still valid because much of it is conceptual about design processes mm. and the teacher's role. Uh, but there are definitely parts of it which could do with updating and so on. And it is certainly the case that I have been asked to do that, but I'm afraid I don't have a great deal of time right now. So as soon as I have time, okay. as soon as I have time, I will be looking to doing something. That's a recorded promise. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Dorothy Kelly, thank you very much. Thank you.